chat, uh, put into the chat the um, the agenda for the day, um, and I'll just quickly go through it. We, you know, we're at the welcome and introductions part that is extending beyond five minutes, but I promise to close here shortly. And then uh, we'll really get into the substance of the conversation around site planning and entitlements and project feasibility and then affordable housing finance, uh, the basics of affordable housing finance with some uh, concluding briefing and remarks by Gary about what's happening at the county about resources and programs, which I suppose are a plenty these days with all the federal money. Somebody told me that 1.2 trillion is, one point, is uh, 1,200 billion. Um, so uh, that just, just to put a fine point on how much that is. Um, there's a lot of money coming from the federal government and the state seems to be in a strong position too. Um, so I'm going to stop at that uh, at this point, but, it, but I do want to take uh, uh, SCAMP's executive director prerogative, prerogative and um, take a moment to uh, introduce our guest speakers today. You know, the, the, what we're, what's going to be discussed today is uh, part of um, a much longer session that we developed uh, in conjunction with uh, with UCLA and some other affordable housing developers a handful of years ago. Um, and we've been offering it as a session at our conference, um, a long form four hour session at, uh, at our conference for the last few years and for private public sector audiences for the last few years also. Um, and so we're, we've sort of trimmed it down to Zoom size uh, to cover the areas that we, uh, that I mentioned before, which really talk about pre-development site planning, entitlement, and project feasibility, and then the basics of affordable housing finance and the low-income housing tax credit. And so our speakers today, the way we do this work is we build the framework and then we use our, uh, invite our members to participate as such subject matter expertise to sort of convey the information. And so on the site planning entitlements component, Laura Regas, who's the Senior Vice President of Development at Abode Communities, and, and I'm sure she'll do an abode communities uh, introduction. It will be better than mine. Uh, but also a SCAMP board member um, is going to talk about that first component. And then um, after uh, Laura finishes up, um, Bill Paveo, the former executive director of the Tax Credit Allocation Committee at the state, um, and I'm happy to say also a former SCAMP board member, um, will be talking about the housing credit program um, and talking about affordable housing finance. And unless I forgot anything with that, I think I'm gonna turn the floor over to you, Laura. And um, uh, again, just express my appreciation for everybody. Oh, oh, so just as a matter of logistics, uh, Jeanette, are we doing Q&A on the questions box? Is that how we wanna do that? Yeah, if you can submit your questions through the Q&A box, we'll save a little bit at the end of Laura's presentation to answer questions and we'll do the same with Bill. Terrific, thanks so much. All right, Laura, floor is yours. Thanks, Alan. Good morning, everybody. Uh, great to see you all here. Um, hopefully, the next time we do one of these, we can do it in person. Um, but thanks for being able to attend and flexible while we take this uh, thing on the Zoom roadshow. Um, I am Laura, again, lead the real estate development division at Abode Communities. We, um, we've been working in California for just over uh, five decades. So um, hopefully, we'll be having a chance to work with a number of you in the near future. Uh, my job today is to kind of hop around um, the topics of kind of site planning, feasibility, and entitlements. Um, there's a lot in here, so um, because we've got a mixed group, I think, of uh, some developers, public officials, and maybe some other kind of service partners, um, you know, forgive me if it seems a little bit uh, too broad, but we're going to try and kind of bring everybody to the same page, and then maybe we can get into a little more detail in the Q&A portion. Um, so, uh, Jeanette or Olivia, let's go to the, the next slide. Actually, we can skip to and go to the agenda. Yeah, there we go. So this is just really quickly a little bit of what we're going to cover today, mostly around kind of the, the site planning and thinking about how do we find the right site and some of the early feasibility and due diligence that goes into that. Um, and then also a little bit more about entitlements. You're going to hear it kind of from the developer's perspective, but I hope there's going to be a lot of good nuggets in there for our public agency partners and a handful of takeaways. So um, please do submit questions along the way in the Q&A uh, chat and we will um, try to get to all of those. So this is where we're going to start kind of where do we find good sites for affordable housing and then as we're looking at them, the kind of analysis that we typically do 
um, which is, you know, what can I build here? How much does it cost? Is there enough financing to pay for it? Is there community and political support? What do we do once we've answered those questions? And then as we start to get into more of the nitty gritty around um, what does it mean to have to secure entitlements or go through a land use approval process? And um, is there a way to get through that quickly um, or, or not? So that's the highlight here. Let's go to the next slide, please. Um, so here's, here's a quick look at where we typically find most of the properties that we end up developing for affordable housing. Um, you know, each developer is a little bit different, but I'll say um, from, from my perspective as at Abode Communities, our, our portfolio is kind of sourced almost half and half between kind of private market or um, joint venture partnership opportunities and um, opportunities that we've been selected to develop through a you know, public agency request for proposal. And that might be with a city, a county. We've also done um, projects with transportation agencies and school districts on excess land that they have that is no longer or um, will never be used for what that organization does uh, typically. So there are really a lot of different kinds of ways to find sites with your public partners. Um, I also understand there are kind of more agencies getting involved. So um, it may be something like Caltrans or um, a, a division of your city that you may not have thought about before, like a Department of Transportation that may operate a public parking lot, something like that. So lots of different ways to find um, public property. Of course, on the private market, we're really looking, uh, we prefer to find um, off-market unlisted opportunities, right, before they're hotly uh, bid around and advertised. Um, and, and typically the two things we're looking for are either vacant land or something that has um, an existing building that will easily be either rehabbed or we have to demolish what's there to redevelop the affordable housing project we want to um, get done. Typically, we try to avoid things that have um, a lot of uh, existing housing on them, right? So we want to preserve the housing that's there rather than have to take that down and redevelop. But occasionally there are opportunities where it makes sense to um, relocate folks, take down what's there, and then rebuild to a much higher density. So we end up with kind of a net uh, positive win-win there in terms of the number of units. Other great ways to find sites are through um, partnerships, either you know, with churches or other nonprofit organizations. We also do um, some partnerships with market rate developers who may have an inclusionary housing requirement or for whatever reason need to find a partner to um, meet the affordable requirements that they're facing or that they want to offer as part of their overall package um, for their master plan. And then of course, there are tools that we look for that cities and counties um, are, are working with on their own. So, you know, updated housing elements or new specific or community plan areas that are in the works because usually it means that there's some new uh, and more favorable development standards in the works that we can look to in certain areas of your uh, city or county. Let's go to the next slide, please. So some real basics as we're starting to look at, you know, sites. Um, so as a developer, you typically know that you want to be able to develop a certain number of units just in order to make it financially feasible. And each developer is a little bit different. Uh, but typically, for, so from our perspective, we're usually looking to be able to develop something that's 50 or 60 units or more. So we're looking for the right kind of site area that can accommodate that number of units based on kind of an average square footage across all the different unit types. Uh, we certainly want to look for sites that already have kind of a high density zoning or a favorable uh, process to get to that finish line in terms of confirming that we can build what we want to build. And then other things that are really critical, and this really ties in probably to what Bill will talk more about later, which is um, once we have a site, we wanna make sure that it's a great site in terms of access to these critical amenities that we all want to have wherever we live, but they're also really important uh, when we're competing for you know, local, regional, or state funding that we have these kinds of amenities within a short distance around the site. So for those of you who work on the public agency side, as you're looking to identify new sites for um, affordable housing development, keep this in mind as you're kind of looking at the map of your city or your jurisdiction. Let's go to the next slide, please. So, so we found a, a general site and um, we think, well, maybe this has potential. We do kind of a quick back of the envelope analysis here. 
Um, and these are the kind of questions we're asking ourselves immediately. So obviously, what's the current zoning? Does it even allow for multifamily residential development? If it doesn't, we may uh, have to set that aside, but we'll potentially do kind of a series of other analyses to see if everything else works, is it worth going through the effort to deal with the zone change? That certainly takes a little more time and we'll talk about that more in a few moments. Um, but otherwise, we wanna know also, what are we planning to build there? And the reason I say that is it makes a difference because you know, a project that's gonna serve families is going to have a different kind of size and unit count and you know, average space requirements than say a senior project or a project that's offering permanent supportive housing, right? Picture, you know, three bedrooms versus studios and one bedrooms. And then we need to have a sense of what other non-residential space do yeah, we need to put in the development? Um, we, we need to make sure that um, we have just the basics, you know, for our residents, right? So we have property management space and community room, those kinds of things. But we also need to understand if there's something else that's happening with the existing either zoning code or other kind of plan requirements that may be triggering us to also think about whether or not we need other uses like a retail space. You know, there may be a, a site that has a mixed use ordinance kind of overlay there. So we need to figure all that stuff out early and plot it out and figure out how much space does that need? And then how much parking do we need to go with that? And as everybody knows, Parking is expensive and can be very contentious. And so we want to have a good idea right up front what the, what the range of options is around parking. How much parking do our units really need given whoever's going to live in them? You know, a, a family project may need more parking than a permit supportive housing project, right? As a good obvious example. But then if there's retail or other commercial needs, we need to understand what those parking requirements are. And then the next critical thing is, well, in order to get the units that I need, based on the development standards and any kind of other setbacks or constraints, how tall will this building end up being? And the reason that that's important is because it drives um, what kind of uh, prevailing wage requirements we might have as we collect funding from our public agency partners. Um, if it's four stories or less, it's going to be subject to residential prevailing wages. If it's five stories or more, it will likely be subject to commercial prevailing wages. And there's a premium to go from residential prevailing wages to commercial prevailing wages. So as you have your kind of cost containment filter on, it's important to take note of that. And then of course, as I mentioned, then we have to figure out like, could I actually build something by right here? Like, do I already meet all the standards that come with that zoning code? Or do I have to go through some sort of planning process? Um, and if it's a planning process, does it, can it be done at the ministerial or staff level or is it discretionary? And do I have to go all the way to say like the planning commission and the city council? So those obviously take more time and money and we'll talk a little bit more about um, the trade-offs there. Let's go to the next slide, please. So uh, of course, even in the site analysis stage, the folks that are doing kind of the business development and acquisition work, they also still have to run all the way through, you know, what's the projected total development cost for the kind of project we're talking about, right? We have to know all that up front because not only are we thinking about well, what will it take to acquire the site and what does it cost to kind of go through the pre-development process, we also have to know what the end game is. So we're kind of thinking all the way through the phases. This is just a quick look at the typical things that are in our pro formas. Um, the various costs that you, you, know, you have to pull together to make a project work. We can have a whole other session about you know, getting into the nitty gritty of these, but I just wanted to kind of show you real quick kind of the range of things that we're thinking about and we need to have good estimates on what all these costs are early on. But let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so kind of as a quick segue into cost for a minute and financing, and then we'll come back to more of the site analysis. And Bill's gonna to touch on this, I think a lot more later. Um, where we start is, okay, we think we know generally what the project costs. How much of the project can we afford to cover just through a conventional loan, right? And so um, many of you, this is like, you already know this backwards and forwards, but I share this because sometimes it's helpful for other parties who are touching the affordable housing in a different way, just to understand kind of the basic building blocks of how we put these performance together. So basically we figure out, you know, what's the revenue we're gonna get from the different affordable housing units that we're gonna be building across the different rents and income levels of the people we're serving. Is it a project that might have some operating subsidy that comes with it? So for example, 
um, could it have a project-based Section 8 contract to support some of those permanent supportive housing units? So that's, you know, on the plus side, income coming in. And then we've got to know, well, what's it cost to operate this kind of a building, this many units? Um, what does it cost to bring resident services in? What's the typical projection for money we have to set aside into a replacement reserve just for wear and tear over time? So you start to take away from those net positive um, incomes and you ultimately get to a net operating income. You say, okay, this is generally what I have to work with. Um, we'll apply something called a debt coverage ratio. And this is kind of an amount of all that net operating income that the bank is gonna make you set aside and say, you can't use that to pay for your mortgage. We want you to have some cushion. So that cushion may range from you know, 15, you know, 1.15 to 1.25, right? If you do the math, you can see you can have less than the total to work with. And once you get to that number, then you say, okay, this is the amount of money I have to work with to pay for a mortgage. And so you can calculate, okay, this is how much of a loan I can get from the bank. Those things. Right. So let's go to the next slide, please. All right, so then part two of that is, okay, if I have a 60 unit project and I think um, total development cost per unit is about $450,000, then I can back into what I still need to cover in terms of that cost. And so we figure out, okay, I, I could get a mortgage for this much, about $62,000 a unit based on that calculation we just talked through. And then I have this big funding gap where am I gonna cover those, that gap from? And so that's when we get into, okay, how much tax credit can I get for this project? What are the other uh, funding opportunities through our public partners at the city and the state and the federal level? And those are typically coming in in the forms of either soft long-term loans that are paid, repaid from net cash flow of the project or their grants. So Bill will talk a lot more about kind of how all this stuff gets layered together, but this is just a really quick look at what we're thinking about on the on the front end of these projects. So let's go to the next slide and um, talk a little bit more about kind of hopping back to the site feasibility uh, framework. So we found a great site. It seems like it will work. We've got to sort through what does it take to get to that official approval so we know we can build what we want to build. Um, and then all the other kind of factors that play into this, right? So. Um, who else do we need to talk to to make sure that there's support for this project, both kind of at the community stakeholder level, but also um, kind of on the political elected official level. And obviously these kind of factors are really important, particularly if we're talking about a project and a site that's going to have to go through some sort of discretionary planning process, right, where there's going to be public hearings and people are going to come speak in support of the project. Do we have more people that support the project than those NIMBYs that might not want to see an affordable housing project get done. So there's kind of all this early calculus about who's out there, who do we need to connect with uh, before we really move forward and start spending money on a given site. Let's go to the next slide, please. So um, a couple other thoughts about, um, you know, thinking about sites and risk management and site control. As I mentioned, right, there's kind of two ways generally to to get to a site. Either you do it through a private market transaction or a partnership, or you're working with a public agency through a kind of request for proposal process. And there's pros and cons to both, right? So we really kind of want to have a portfolio that's balanced. So we're not heavily weighted on all one or the other. So in a private market transaction, what we always really want to structure is, you know, a long escrow with a patient seller who will let us work through you know, getting through the land use approval process. And if we're really lucky, even getting through some of the financing uh, phase so that we are not immediately kind of taking down the land and spending acquisition money and interest while we're going through a two to three year period. Occasionally though, we find a great site and we just say, okay, it's worth it. Let's snap that site up. And then we're, you know, we're just kind of managing the risk around uh, what it takes to control a site while we work through that project. On the flip side, it's great to work with public agencies through their RFP process because um, we're able to work together as a team and in partnership and we don't have to be kind of spending all this acquisition money early on. We're still spending plenty, plenty of pre-development money, but we're not having to deal with an acquisition loan and interest. Obviously, the flip side is that a public agency process is competitive and so not everybody, only one entity can win each time and so lots of firms will um, get into the process 
put money and time into putting those proposals together and then you know only one party wins. So that's the flip side, right? You control your destiny if you're doing a private market transaction, but then on the public agency proposal side, it's a competitive process. But either way, you, you know, everybody has to understand what the process looks like to get from start to finish. So, you know, depending on how involved that land use process might be with your local jurisdiction, you could, you know, take six to 12 months just to get through that process, occasionally longer. But if it's longer than that, we, we're typically going to say no to that opportunity and look for others. Um, and then it usually takes about at least two years to secure the different public financing that we need to cobbled together to make the project work. And that's because we typically can't apply for everything at once. We have to go kind of piece by piece. And um, so usually we start at the local level and the regional level, and then we go to the state level to compete for funding there. And then ultimately we're gonna apply for tax credits. And that's kind of our last stop on the competitive process. Once we get those tax credits, then we've got all the funding we need. And then we're just going through the work of bringing in our investor and our final construction lender and kind of doing all the paperwork. Obviously, many of you know what it's like to go through a construction uh, drawing kind of plan check permitting process that, you know, you have to move that process um, along even while you're still securing some of your financing. So you're spending money on those uh, drawings and those design teams while you're waiting to put all your financing together. So that can take anywhere from, you know, six to 12 to 15 months, depending on how complicated it is to work through that jurisdiction. And then finally, you get to break ground and you've got a construction project. And you know, depending on the type of that project, it's generally gonna take somewhere between like 15 and 20 months, 20 months to build it. So we calculate, okay, we know what the, we know what the interest costs are um, and everything that comes with that construction period in terms of additional costs. And then finally, once you're, um, sorry, I'm distracted by the noise in the background. Um, once you finally have your project built, then we've got to get through the lease up and stabilization process. And depending on kind of how big the project is and how complicated it may be in terms of the different kinds of populations we're, um, we're serving, it may take anywhere from six to nine months to get through that process as well. Um, and so obviously while we're going through that process, we're still paying for construction loan interest. And so, um, you know, you can see how a, a given affordable housing projects timeline really kind of stretches out over multiple years. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so just a few notes about cost. This will not really surprise anybody, but um, it's amazing how the decisions you make really early on you're, they really drive what happens with your project, with, with some exception along the way. So um, it's really critical to have um, a great site with you know, great development standards, a public agency partner that really understands what you're trying to build so that you can avoid a lot of these challenges that come up early on um, where you may be having to add things to your project to you know, quote unquote, satisfy some stakeholders, but they're really just adding cost to your project and they're not really adding a lot of value. So we really wanna keep an eye out for um, a scenario where we might end up having to make some tough, tough decisions around um, design that in the end, we may have to try to pull back later or if we're going through a planning process and it is so set in stone that, you know, for example, you must have balconies on every unit and there's no room to dial those back later, other tough decisions will have to be made around the design in order to do what we call value engineering at the last minute. If the costs start to escalate as the market you know, heats up and construction costs continue to rise like they have been in the last few years. So um, having a great site, a good partner at the public agency, a great design team um, is really critical to trying to avoid some of these um, cost challenges later on. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so um, these last couple of slides, they're really heavy on the words and I apologize, but a handful of things we just wanted to you know, make sure we cover. Um, and for those of you who may be newer to this, when we talk about zoning, we're talking about the standards that come for a given site. Those are usually found in the city's municipal code. It's not the building code, so it's a little bit different. So they're the rules for you know, how you put together generally what you wanna build. And then the building code is where you get real into the real nitty gritty of what you can and can't you know, construct. At the, at the real detailed level. 
usually, you know, the, the zoning and the municipal codes are really focused on kind of quality of life issues. So the general like design standards, you know, we want the sidewalks to be, you know, a certain width and we want the buildings to be set back a certain amount. Um, you know, there may be some standards around uh, height or um, open space, you know, those kinds of things are all kind of general quality of life issues. If you think about what it feels like to walk down the street and pass these kinds of buildings. Um, what we found is that a lot of jurisdictions that have multifamily housing uh, zone already set up, there's a lot of similarity across jurisdictions, um, but some you know, are more kind of particular than others. Um, other jurisdictions just may not have seen a lot of affordable housing um, in their you know, history. And so they're trying to figure out how do we, how do we create a more um, welcoming environment to get more affordable housing done. So there's a lot of conversation we can have about that, but there's also a lot of jurisdictions who are already doing it that we can look to to say, okay, take a look at, look at the R4 zone in this city. It's generally you know, a pretty good path in terms of thinking about development standards. And then of course here, the last bullet on the slide is just a little bit of what I mentioned, like the kinds of things that are covered by zoning are these big picture issues but we have to know what they are up front so we can figure out the conceptual design of the building and figure out where everything goes and make sure that we're in kind of working within that box, so to speak, or that envelope that comes with those zoning rules. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so um, by right or entitlements process required. I'm gonna cut to the chase here and say, by right is the dream. Um, for those developers who are on the call, you probably know that it's very rare to find a site that you can just develop by right. So there's usually some kind of planning process you have to go through. And then the question is, well, how complicated is that planning process? Um, obviously a lot has changed in the last couple of years and there's new streamlining tools that help us kind of work through the process a little bit faster, but we have to know from the get-go just how complicated or tricky that process is going to be. And every jurisdiction has different kind of rules or mechanisms to get through a planning process. So um, generally speaking, we want to, we want to find uh, sites that already have the right baseline zoning. We don't necessarily want to have to go through a really complicated process to try and get um, a zone changed or get a general plan adjustment. Um, we really want to find something that's pretty much dialed in already and was intended for you know, either commercial or multifamily development. This, the language on the slide here is just a little bit more kind of background about what you end up with. If you go through a planning process, you'll get this determination letter and it kind of spells out the details of what you got approved. And it'll have all kinds of conditions um, that have to do with other agencies, even in the city. So for example, you know, what does the Bureau of Engineering require you to do with sidewalks? Uh, what do you have to do to meet fire standards or street lights? And so kind of lots of different conditions that will be made clear to us all in the early stages. Obviously, the last bullet here is kind of really important. You can't really move your project forward, generally speaking, and find funding for the project unless you have your entitlements in place. So when you think about that development timeline, the faster you can get your entitlements or your land use approvals, the faster you'll be able to transition into collecting the funds for that project so we can get it to construction. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, um, this is one of our last slides. I promise I'll stop talking in a minute and you guys can ask questions. Um, a handful of other things just to keep an eye out for as you're looking at sites. We talked a lot about the basics around how big is it? Does it, you know, how high can I build? How many units can I fit there? But there's some other critical things you need to be thinking about. Um, and they're kind of basic, but it's important to, to mention them first. So obviously, you know, does it have a relatively flat grade? You know, building on a hillside is really tricky. It's really expensive. So let's try to avoid those. Um, the shape of the lot, you know, rectangular is generally better square rectangular. You don't want to have things that are like weird triangles or trapezoids because you really end up kind of losing a lot of that space because you generally don't build a, a building in a triangular shape, right? Um, power lines and utilities, this is a really big one. Um, Power lines cause lots of problems. <laughs> you have to figure out if you have a site where you can work around either utility structure that's there, or if you're gonna actually have to work with 
the local utility to underground the lines or move the lines over so they're far enough away from the building. This, as you know, can get really complicated and expensive. Um, and if you're doing anything around modular construction, those wires are really tricky, right? Because you're talking about craning things over, up and over a site, so you don't want power lines to be in the way. So it's really important to look at what's happening with the utility uh, infrastructure before you get too far down the road. Um, fire department access, this is absolutely critical. Um, try to avoid sites that are really kind of like narrow and deep because it really limits how you, what you can do with your site in order to accommodate what the fire department will want you to do. So if you have a really long and narrow site, you'll end up losing a lot of that site to create like an emergency vehicle access down one side of it, something like that. So a great architect will see these immediately up front and recognize, okay, we're going to be limited here because of X, Y, and Z requirements. Uh, and then of course, easements. I think everybody knows what an easement is, but occasionally you'll find a, a, you might find a great site, but it's got a funky arrangement with an easement. So you just got to check the title report and the survey. You need to know what's at play there. Is it something that you can live with? Um, can you get it removed? You know, working through what those issues are. And um, highway dedications, this is just along the lines of what's that city going to require you to do along the frontage of your site? Are you going to have to step the building back even further? Do you need extra sidewalk space, you know, kind of what's happening along the roadways there that might be different than the current site condition, what will the city require you to do? And then finally, for those of you who are looking at sites that have something on it already, historic resource issues are really important. You need to know right away up front if you are dealing with a site that might have some sort of historic consideration because it's uh, it's limiting and it's very expensive to have to deal with those kinds of issues. So depending on if you're rehabbing a site or if you think you actually want to demo what's there, there's a whole process to get that kind of clearance to make sure that it's not on the potential historic resource uh, list of projects. I think we can go to the final slide now. I think we just got one left. Yeah. Okay. So just kind of a recap, um, thinking about our public agency partners, you know, the name of the game is the more ready that site is the more work that the city has kind of put into it up front, the faster the process will go you know, through. So is it the right kind of size site? Is it flat? Does it have the right zoning and general plan alignment already? If all of that is kind of set up before kind of we, the developer gets there, the process is just gonna be easier and faster. Um, as I mentioned, of course, best case scenario, it's just a buy right opportunity. We don't even have to go through a complicated planning process. Worst case, and our, for us would be just kind of a process that can be approved at the staff level and doesn't inc include, you know, uh, triggering a public hearing or an EIR or a kind of subjective design review process. Um, we talked a little bit about utilities in terms of like what's already there, but the other issue that's important to know, um, particularly if you're a public agency, a staff person is what does your local utility partner have already in terms of infrastructure in the neighborhood? Um, we've seen a lot of challenges where we're trying to do new urban infill redevelopment and there's not enough power, so to speak, right in that immediate neighborhood to provide uh, what's required by a new, say, 100 unit building. And so then the developer is having to put money into bringing that infrastructure kind of down the street underground, potentially, um, to bring that excess power closer to the site. So then, of course, the most important thing is um, those public agency partners who really understand this process are so great to work with. And the more that uh, public agency staff um, and the affordable housing development team can really partner up and work kind of hand in hand through all the different hurdles, the faster and easier the process will be. Um, and I think it's really, um, it's really a lovely experience when we've got kind of a team that's working together. So with that, I am going to stop talking now, and I think we can take this. Yeah, thank you, Jeanette. We can take the screen down and see if there are any questions. While I was talking, I didn't get to look at the chat. So, Jeanette, I don't or Alan, I don't know if you wanted to facilitate a Q and A or how you'd like to go from here. Yeah, Jeanette, are we going to do all the questions at the end, or you want to take some? There's a couple of questions here. I think that we could handle. Yeah, we just have a few minutes. We can do um, two or three questions right now before we get to Bill. Okay, real quick. Um, so there's, I just want to make sure that the person that put something in here about high opportunity areas, I, my, 
personal opinion is that fits better in the financing piece and I promise that we'll come back to it. But I see a couple other ones down here that talk about impacts of CEQA and there's two notions in here. One is what is the impact of CEQA? And then the other one in there is, um, I read it to be sort of state override of local loaning, zoning and land use. Like what capacity does the state have to be able to make the entitlement process at the local level easier and faster? So, so the general CEQA question, right? Alan, um, yeah, C, you know, CEQA, CEQA reform is much needed. I think that, um, <clears throat> that you've seen a lot of bills at the state legislature. Um, some of them have gotten approved, some of them haven't, but the whole idea here is we've got to figure out a way to streamline these projects in different cities across the state so that we can build more housing faster. And so you'll see that there's a handful of um, bills that have said, particularly for projects that are doing permanent supportive housing, we're trying to get our you know, homeless neighbors off the street, but there's, there's opportunities for just an outright CEQA exemption. And that's particularly valuable, but it's not, uh, it's not something that's kind of currently available across the board. So like, you know, any affordable housing project could get a CEQA exemption. And so I think as a, as a group here, we need to look for ways to be able to um, streamline more projects so they could get either CEQA exemptions, categorical exemptions across the board. So yeah, you're right, CEQA is a big one. And you know, we have certainly dealt with our own um, challenges with people filing CEQA lawsuits to stop a project. I will tell you most of the time, it's actually not about CEQA, it's about something else that that person is uh, wanting to get as a result. And they use the CEQA uh, legal challenge as a mechanism to kind of force that conversation slash negotiation. So um, I think the more that we work on the even better public policy, we can avoid those kinds of roadblocks. Alan, I think the second one was about um, what can, either what is the state doing or what can the state do? I, well, I think the, the answer includes two, those two things, but the question really, the question really was, gosh, you know, entitlements take a really long time. It's really hard. It seems like the state should do something about that. <laughs> do you want to tackle that, Alan? <laughs> well, I could, I guess, um, you know, uh, certainly the, I don't know the, the uh, Al Marshall, but uh, he probably knows more than I do. I see you. Um, uh, my, you know, land use has been historically the parlance of, of uh, the, the purview of local government and, um, and they exercise that right. And sometimes they exercise it by not exercising it. Um, but it's also um, just uh, heavily defended um, in the context of public policy making. So the state has uh, made some attempts um, for example, the supportive housing uh, streamlining um, uh, concept that you talked about, Laura, uh, happened a couple of years ago. 2017 was kind of a banner year for state intervention and affordable housing generally. So there are a few um, state overrides of local land use um, requirements if your locality is behaving in a certain way. Um, and I would just say that the I would say two things. One is in 2017 and on an ongoing basis, the state has indicated some interest and willingness to kind of um, engage in a override of local land use power. Um, I, and to the extent that they have done it, um, I think that uh, the use of those tools is still sort of being tested. Um, that people are trying to use these tools with some effect in some places um, and less effect in other places. So um, I don't know, unless you have anything to add to that. I think that's great. Yeah, I think, you know, things like, um, you know, AB 1763 kind of amped up what the state's density bonus program can do, SB 35 and SB 330, those are all kind of aimed at speeding the process along. But um, you know, those two only work well if you already have kind of the underlying zoning and conditions that you need. Um, if, if we're talking about a, a site or a neighborhood that's really not already set up for kind of a speedy development, then it's still going to take a while. Um, I do think we'll probably see more bills continue to come through at the legislature until we start to see kind of 
all jurisdictions across the state really amping up their affordable housing production. And I, I've certainly worked with folks at different jurisdictions who say um, they like having the cover of, you know, the state, the state bill, but um, that, you know, kind of helps them get the job done. But I've also met other folks who really want to kind of at the city level, really move along their own land use ordinances to kind of get ahead of it. So hopefully we'll have more of the latter, um, but the state, the state tools do help here and there. So at the risk of going over time, just this, there's this one last question here that I think is kind of interesting about the posture of the local agency, whether it's acting as this kind of regulatory gatekeeper about what gets built as opposed to, hey, we're open for business, um, really want to be your partner in this deal. Um, do you have anything to say about <laughs> the difference between working different agencies that have either the regulatory filtering strategy or the more open concierge service as they call it here? <laughs> well, I think that the, the concierge service or the, the demeanor is excellent where, um, you know, you certainly, I'll certainly find uh, staff at different public agencies who, who know what the tools are already and will encourage the developer to pursue one of them because you know they, they know about the dynamics kind of behind the scene with the, maybe the city council or something. And so they'll often steer us you know, one way or the other, even though we have kind of a, a range of menu uh, of options. Um, I do think that those kinds of opportunities are really important. We're, we're working with the jurisdiction actually um, in Northern California where the staff is just super knowledgeable and immediately kind of engaging um, their other partners in the different divisions to, to think ahead about, you know, how do we solve even like the, the transportation intersection problem right next to that site that we know the council person cares about. It's not actually immediately tied to what needs to happen at the site, but it's going to come up. So let's think ahead about how we can just make the whole process run smoother, right? So really good kind of intra-jurisdiction um, work happening or inter, I should say. Um, obviously, like I was saying easier like earlier, the more the sites are ready and the zoning and the, and the land use plans are just already aligned, it's just so much easier, but we really appreciate kind of the, the jurisdictions that take that kind of hands-on case management approach to partnering with the developer that might approach them about a given site. Thanks, Laura. All right. Um, I think what we're going to do in the name of uh, time and efficiency, we're going to transition now to the uh, next portion of the agenda, which is really about uh, the financing um, of affordable housing, some of the basics and the low income housing tax credit. And as I mentioned before, Bill Paveo is going to be talking about that. Um, Mr. Paveo, you have the floor. Great. Well, thanks, Alan. And I'm, I'm hoping everybody can hear me okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Yes. Um, well, thanks for uh, the opportunity. Um, may I also ask so, do we have like a hard stop at 11 or? Just to kind of update myself on the time frame here. Um, well, it, the the Zoom won't shut off at eleven, but my guess is we'll start to lose people then. But um. okie dokie. All right. Well, I will try to keep this succinct. Um, as I think you may have mentioned in the introductions, um, ordinarily this presentation is a bit longer, um, but I will keep it to the time available. Um, also, I've provided you with slides and some of those slides contain information that I'll just simply make available to you for later consideration. And I, I won't dwell on some of those slides that are more information intensive, but uh, you'll have that uh, for your consideration later. Um, uh, finally, I just noticed like one of the participants, Brian is driving. So please don't look at this presentation while I'm doing it, okay? It'll be an audio for you. Um, all right, let's go to the next slide. Um, this is just an outline of what I'm proposing to cover, which is just how affordable housing is financed, in particular, multifamily affordable rental housing. Uh, also gonna spend some time on the federal low-income housing tax credit program, that, that kind of black box. We're gonna peek inside there and see how it works. And then finally, uh, touch a bit on, on how California administers uh, that federal low-income housing tax credit program. Next slide. Uh, so Laura actually already touched on uh, quite a bit of this uh, in terms of what developers begin to think about very early on as they contemplate 
uh, a development. And so perhaps again, they've identified a site and they're beginning to think about, okay, what am I gonna put on this site? How big a project can I get in there? And, and uh, how, many, how many units and what kind of units? Are they gonna be studios or one bedrooms or twos? And, and what kinds of incomes am I gonna target in each of those unit types? And as a result, what kind of rent uh, is it gonna generate? Um, so they begin to think very early on, but they also think about these developments in phases for purposes of financing. Um, so a, it's almost like a matrix how they think about this. And so one way they think about it is they have to come up with a, a capital funding package that is going to get this development built. That is, how do I pay to get this thing built? Uh, the second thing they begin to think about very early on is, okay, once the project is completed and up and running and fully occupied and stabilized, um, how am I going to cover my expenses? And let's make sure it's generating enough income from various sources uh, to cover those expenses and including debt service, et cetera. Uh, and then finally, um, more and more often these days, developers are also thinking very carefully about what kinds of services are we gonna have available on site once the property is up and running? And how am I gonna pay for those services? And um, I should mention these services packages um, that are delivered right on site to the residents uh, apply not only to permanent supportive housing, which usually are developed to house um, uh, persons coming out of homelessness or, or, or persons with um, special needs, but even just large family deals or senior deals usually now are thinking about some sort of services packages and, um, and, and how they're going to pay for those. Okay, next slide. Uh, this next slide is really just to kind of give you a ballpark. Again, I think Laura might have touched on this a little bit um, in the Inland Empire. You know, what kind of costs are we talking about here? This is probably a good ballpark estimate of what it might cost. Uh, to develop a deal in your region. Uh, land costs can be quite varied, uh, but uh, you can see land cost is a, a major component. Hard construction costs, of course, is typically the biggest piece. There are miscellaneous soft costs associated with just lining up the fine. Hey, am I muted? Am I, am I back? You're back. You're okay, back. thank you. How, how long had I been muted? Very short, two, two or three seconds. Very okay, good. thank you. All right, so this slide just kind of gives you an estimate of the component, the major component costs of a deal and roughly what those costs are gonna look like in the Inland Empire. Uh, the next slide. Um, I mentioned that sort of matrix thinking style used by developers. The, the other dimension to that matrix is uh, literally the timed phases of the development. And you can see uh, we've listed them here. One is sort of the pre-development phase and developers have to think about how am I gonna cover those pre-development costs? Meaning those costs leading up to the beginning of construction. And those costs are gonna include things like uh, the, the cost of, of, of acquiring the property um, hiring architects to begin to do some preliminary work, um, squaring away, you mentioned CEQA in the earlier presentation, and meeting those requirements, conducting community meetings, um, you know, getting your entitlements, all of those costs come under that heading pre-development phase and a, a separate funding package is put together by developers to cover those costs during that phase. The second phase is of course the construction period. So once the project is underway, uh, with construction uh, through completion, that phase typically has its own separate funding package. And, and I should mention each of these phases, uh, the, the two subsequent phases after pre-development, one of the costs that's being paid in that phase is the prior phases costs. So for example, usually your construction financing package, one of the costs is pay, uh, pay off that pre-development loan. Similarly, that permanent financing phase, that is once the project is completed and occupied and stabilized, there is typically a separate, again, separate financing package that then um, stays in place for a longer period of time, be it 15 or, or 30 years, if it's a 30 year mortgage, for example. Um, so that's a permanent financing package. Again, one of the component costs that it is typically paying off or paying down 
is the construction period financing. So the developer, again, has to think about these sort of three separate phases that comes with its own financing package that they have to identify and line up um, before they even really begin, um, begin construction or get too far down the line. Next slide. Okay, so this is a little bit busier slide, but all it's really communicating is that like almost any real estate transaction, um, like a home purchase, for example, that real estate transaction is gonna be financed with some combination of debt and equity. Uh, so again, in a home purchase, the debt, of course, is you go get a, a, a loan from a bank and uh, they record a deed of trust against your property and lend you the money uh, for the, you know, the largest chunk of the purchase. But then there's also equity in the deal, typically in the form of a down payment in the uh, home buying example. Uh, same thing applies to multifamily affordable housing developments. That is, there's some combination of debt and, and equity in the deal. Um, the debt, however, is a little different than your typical um, home mortgage scenario. That is, the debt typically comes in two varieties. One is just conventional hard debt, meaning just a, a typical bank loan, for example. And Laura touched on this, that early on, the developer is gonna figure out how much income is this property gonna generate once it's operating and what are its expenses going to be and what is, the, what is the balance that's left after that income pays those expenses? And with that, that surplus, if you will, that net operating income that Laura described, you can go borrow against that or borrow against a large portion of that net operating income. And uh, that, that financing would be in the form of just a conventional loan where there are must pay uh, mortgage payments due uh, either monthly or semi-annually or perhaps annually. Um, but a separate type of um, debt in, in these affordable housing developments is what we refer to as soft loans, meaning these are loans. So they're, the intent is that they eventually be repaid, but the terms of repayment are much more flexible and, and they're frequently um, structured so that payments are made um, periodically if the project can afford it. And so typically that's an annual exercise where once all of the project's bills and, and operating expenses have been paid uh, and the hard debt debt service has been paid. Only if there is um, revenue left over after that or, or cash flow, only then does the soft debt lender look for a, a partial repayment. It's not uncommon uh, for these soft loans um, to not only not see a payment of of principle, but perhaps even there's accruing interest uh, on these loans over time. That is, if the property can't uh, afford to make a payment, then um, then these soft lenders forgive that year's payment and, and it just accrues. Finally, that, that final bullet there with the sub bullets talks about um, the equity piece. And again, we're gonna spend some time with the low income housing tax credit program, which is typically the single uh, largest facilitator of the infusion of of equity. And again, equity is, is literally um, cash in the deal to cover uh, those development costs that is not um, in the form of a loan. It's not repayable. It's typically the owner is putting cash in the deal. Another source though is potentially grants. Uh, that's a little bit of a rare bird, but sometimes that is another source of, um, of capital that does not require repayment. Okay, next slide. Um, let's see, I, I mentioned soft loans, just another second on that. Um, those loans typically do have an interest um, rate attached to them, although sometimes they're 0% interest. More typically, they're, you know, say, 3% simple interest. That's a typical state of California loan term. Um, you see the term simple there in quotes. That's simply referring to the fact that if in any given year, a developer a uh, property owner cannot make a loan payment or, or even on the accrued interest that year, then the next year, the interest will be calculated not on the original principal and accrued interest, but simply on the original principal. In other words, you're not gonna be accruing interest on the interest. <laughs> it, it is simply going to be interest accruing on the outstanding principal. Um, so it's, it's a more generous term than you know, a compounding interest um, loan, like, well, like on your credit card, for example. Um, 
let's see. Um, I already mentioned the payments are are on a as able to pay basis. That a term of art is that you may hear is residual receipts, meaning again, only if there's cash left over at the end of the year would these lenders look for a soft loan repayment or payment. Um, principal and interest accrues over time. A lot of times these are very long-term loans. At the state level, it's common to have 55-year loan terms. Literally, if over the 55-year term, you know, conceivably, if the principal hasn't been paid down and interest has been accruing, then that loan becomes due and payable in year after year 55. Um, so again, very generous terms on these loans. Um, these lenders may charge an annual administration fee um, and they also almost always come with some regulatory re responsibilities. That is, they're making you these very generous loans so that, um, uh, so that they will get a public benefit outcome, typically restricted um, qualifying incomes for residents um, uh, getting into the property and then restricted rents charged to those tenants. Okay, next slide. Now, I'm not actually tracking in chat questions. So again, um, Jeanette or, or somebody, if you're, if you're tracking the questions and you want to stop me, it may be most appropriate to stop me right at the slide, but I defer to you on that. OK, uh, this is just a quick slide on local programs. You all probably know this already, that you have some um, uh, sources of, of um, revenue that you can make available to help with the uh, uh, with defraying the costs of uh, affordable rental housing development. Some of these are federal funds, so these may be HUD administered, uh, Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development administered programs like the Community Development Block Grant Program it can be used for some purposes, site acquisition, for example. Uh, program uh, can be a source of revenue to help uh, get these projects developed. Uh, you may have locally generated funds, uh, so maybe you've got a, a commercial linkage fee locally or, or some other um, uh, revenue generating source that, that capitalizes perhaps a locally administered housing trust fund. Uh, so again, at the state level, for example, in their competitions, it's not uncommon for them to competitively reward applicants who have some local funding sources in the deal to help defray those costs. Okay, next slide. Okay, so we're gonna now talk about um, low-income housing tax credits. And um, this slide just gives you a little bit of orientation to the program. Um, the Federal Low-Income Housing Tax Credit Program was created by the Tax Reform Act of 1986. So think, think Reagan administration. And um, it was part of a larger tax reform bill um, and it really synced up with the federal government's trend at the time of really stepping back uh, from, a, from a role that it had had formerly, which was um, to act as a, a public lender um, for affordable rental housing development. They kind of wanted to get out of that business by and large. And so in developing this tax bill, they thought, well, if we're no longer going to be the direct lender to get these projects developed, um, how are we gonna facilitate um, the delivery of capital to help defray those development costs? And they came up with tax incentives uh, in the form of this low-income housing tax credit program. And in summary, what it does is it provides tax incentives for private investors to become partners slash co-owners um, of, of these rental properties and, and, and put their capital into the development of these deals and in return, they will get significant tax benefits for doing that. Typically, and by the way, I should pause here and let you know that what I'm describing now is really kind of the simplest version of how these entities are structured and how these deals come together. And they can range from very simple to very complex, but let me just describe the simple version to you. Uh, the simplest version is a, a limited partnership is formed by the developer and the developer becomes the general partner. You might think of him as the managing general partner, the decision maker in this partnership. Um, and they will bring in, in the simplest case, a single limited partner. So think of the simplest case being, you've got a general partner and you've got a limited partner. Um, and the, the ownership proportion of that partnership is 
um, the general partner, um, the developer, uh, is going to have a 0.01% ownership interest in that partnership. And the limited partner, think of them as the big investor, the, the tax beneficiary, <laughs> um, is going to have a 99.9% .9 ownership interest in that partnership. And the reason why the developer slash main decision maker around the project has such a small ownership interest in the partnership that owns the property uh, is that they want all of the tax benefits associated with that property to accrue to the benefit of the limited partner. So the partnership is gonna, is gonna accrue these tax benefits and they wanna structure that partnership so that all of those benefits flow to that limited partner. Um, so they structure it so that the limited partner has the 99.9% .9 ownership interest. So all, virtually all of those tax benefits flow to that investor, that limited partner. Now, now bear in mind that the general partner, the developer in many instances is a, a nonprofit corporation. So they don't even have a, a federal tax liability. So, so tax benefits really are meaningless to them for practical purposes. But even in the case where the developer is a for-profit, they are almost invariably structured as I've shown it here, that, that even the for-profit developer, uh, they're, they're in the deal not for the tax benefits, but for, for other purposes. Um, and and they, they too want all of the tax benefits to flow to that limited partner. Um, that, that second um, uh, teal colored bullet there uh, that refers to a bundle of tax benefits, that's just to alert you that this partnership is gonna accrue tax benefits that include not only the low income housing tax credits, but also um, uh, other tax benefits that accrue to to any rental property owner. So for example, um, uh, rental property owners can, can account for the depreciation of their property over time um, under tax law, the depreciation in value uh, over time. They can account for that in their tax returns by, by offsetting uh, other taxable gains um, in their investment portfolio with these losses. And so, so again, these investors are getting into these deals for a, a bundle of tax benefits, the largest piece of which are these low income housing tax credits. That final bullet on this slide just alerts you that these investors are going to get the benefit from these low income housing tax credits over a 10 year period. Um, uh, and so in each of 10 years, typically the first 10 years of the property's operation, they're going to get these tax benefits each year. But they're taking on responsibilities for adherence to the rules associated with the low income housing tax credit program for 15 years. In other words, even beyond the 10th year when they're no longer getting those federal tax benefits, they have a remaining five years of responsibility uh, to make sure that that the rules are adhered to under federal law, or there are federal tax consequences, even say in year 13. That is, these taxpayers, these investors, if they um, violate the rules of the federal program, could face consequences, including recapture of, um, of those tax benefits. That is, those foregone taxes, you now gotta pay them. Uh, and there could be severe penalties. So. The consequences are quite serious, and as a result, you you see pretty um, pretty dedicated adherence to the requirements uh, for those 15 years because nobody wants to deal with the IRS um, in any circumstance if they can help it. Okay, next slide. Uh, this just sort of visually represents what those partnerships look like. It's a limited partnership. They in the simplest form, have a single asset, that property, uh, and the partnership is the ownership of the partnership is divided in that 0.01% and 99.99% ratio. All right, next slide. Um, just, just to kind of preview why these low income housing tax credits are important. Um, a developer, and I think Laura mentioned this in her presentation, you know. A developer kind of goes through a sequence of, 
of lining up their capital stack, their, their various sources of capital that are going to get this project developed. Um, and, and the last piece to fall into place typically is a, res, a reservation of low income housing tax credits from, from the state. And um, uh, when the developer is successful in getting that reservation of credits, they then go out into the capital marketplace and in essence offer to the community of investors, hey, I've got these credits that one can take against their federal tax liability for the next 10 years. Who's interested in these? And um, who would like to become my partner in this partnership? And how much are you willing to invest in that partnership to get these credits? Um, and so in many cases, a, a bidding process occurs of sorts where various investors will say, I'll give you X dollars on the dollar uh, for those credits. And you can see there in the final bullet on this slide, investors will frequently in the Inland Empires these days say, I'll give you 85 cents on the dollar uh, for those tax credits. And so, um, you know, again, if you've got a uh, million dollars worth of tax credits, then they may bid $850,000 uh, to get their hands on those credits. Um, and it ranges up to 95 cents for a dollar's worth of credit, typically in the Inland Empire. Um, when I first was at the tax credit committee up in Sacramento, it wasn't uncommon to see bids north of a dollar on the dollar. And you may be thinking, why would an investor be willing to pay more than a dollar for something whose value itself is only a dollar? And it goes back to that bundle of tax benefits I mentioned earlier. That is, um, again, when I was first at the committee, it wasn't uncommon to see bids of $1.14 on the dollar. But again, those investors were bidding not just for that dollar's worth of tax credit, they were also bidding on, on, on those losses that really amounted to, when you aggregate it with the tax credit, maybe $1.35's worth of tax benefit, and they were bidding a buck 14 for that $1.35's uh, worth of benefit. And so in their minds, at the end of 10 years, they would have received not only uh, a return of their investment, but a return, a handsome return potentially, of their investment or on their investment. So um, they would get a return of their investment and on their investment at the end of 10 years. And ideally at the end of that 10 years, that investor then would be prepared to simply walk away as in I've, I've reaped my benefits, I'm done, leaving the property in the hands of the general partner, ideally. And most partnership agreements these days are structured roughly that way. Okay. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. Um, so these low-income housing tax credits are made available through the state, uh, the administering agency up in Sacramento is the Tax Credit Allocation Committee. Uh, they're housed in the state treasurer's office. Um, and for each development, um, the, um, the maximum amount of credits for which a given development qualifies is based on a formula. And, and that formula has two variables in it. Uh, one is what type of federal credit are you applying for? And you've probably heard the terms 9% credits or 4% credits. And you may be thinking 9% of what or 4% of what? Well, the short answer is uh, it's a percentage of the project's basis and more on that in the next slide. But the 9% and the 4% are one of the, you know what, let's go, there we go. Let's stay with this slide just for a quick second. The 9% and the 4% are one of the factors in that two factor formula. So it's either 9% times a basis number or it's 4% times a basis number. And the result is how much credit you qualify for, for that project. Uh, just a couple of other notes on on those two types of federal credit, the 9% credits and the 4% credits. The 9% credit authority, the more generous of the two types of credit is limited uh, at the federal level by state. And so each state is granted only so much authority each year um, for uh, allocating out 
9% credits statewide. The 4%, uh, the less generous credit is unlimited at the federal level, but it is tied to a specific source of debt financing. So again, we're talking about a, a mechanism at the federal level that brings in equity, but this particular mechanism, the 4% credits are tied to a specific source of debt, which is tax exempt bond financing. And so if one gets tax exempt bond financing, one can access these 4% credits. And the tax exempt bond financing as the term implies is um, a mechanism by which the developer can get a loan um, uh, from a lender, typically a, a bank, could be an insurance company or, 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 or others, but it's a loan, the interest of which uh, is exempt from federal taxation. So ideally the developer would be getting an interest rate break because that lender is getting their principal and interest repaid um, without exposure to taxation. So ordinarily they would be charging perhaps even a significantly reduced interest rate. These days, because interest rates are so low, there isn't much differential between tax exempt bond financing interest rates and just conventional interest rates. But affordable housing developers still wanna access that, that tax exempt bond financing because it gives them entree to these 4% credits that entice in that free money uh, in the form of, of equity from investors. Okay. Okay, the next slide, um, uh, harkens to one of the basic requirements of the low income housing tax credit program. And that is we're trying to develop housing that's affordable um, to folks at certain income levels or at or below certain income levels. Typically the income targeting is 60% of area median income and below, but within the last couple of years, Congress has allowed some units to be pegged as high as 80% of area median income and below or county median income and below, so long as those 80% units are in essence offset with some even more deeply targeted units that gets the project back to an average of 60% AMI targeting. So again, if some, if some of your units are going to go up to 80% AMI targeting, then some of your units probably need to come down to 40% AMI targeting so that on average Again, you've got a project that's coming in at 60% average area median income targeting. Uh, I've given you a couple of, again, teal colored bullets here that just orient you to the Inland Empire's numbers. 60% uh, AMI uh, incomes in Riverside and San Bernardino these days for purposes of this program are about 47,400 for a family of um, four. Uh, and 80% AMI is about 63,000 and change for a household of four. Rents for a two bedroom unit that probably house that family of four. Um, those rents are probably gonna come in at about $1,066 if you're targeting that 60% AMI household. If you're going up to the higher limit, then you, you can charge up to $1,422 a month um, for rent. So that again, just kind of orients you to the order of magnitude on the incomes and rents that are the maximums uh, under this federal program. Okay, the next slide. All right, so this gets us kind of back to that formula where it's, it's either 9% or 4% times the basis in the deal. And so let's talk a little bit about, okay, what is basis? So you might think about basis as you look um, at a developer's list of development costs. It, it's a subset of the total development cost. Uh, and it's those portions of the total development cost that are directly attributable to the development of a physical asset that is gonna depreciate in value over time under federal tax law. So again, under federal tax law, the, the notion is that when you build something, it immediately begins to lose value as it ages now, in reality, we know actually properties frequently go up in value over time, but under tax law, you can, you can count the devaluation or the depreciation uh, to your benefit for, for taxation purposes. So only those physical assets, though, can be depreciated. And so there are costs that cannot be depreciated and therefore are not part of basis under this program. The largest single exclusion from basis is land. 
So again, under federal law, land does not depreciate in value over time. Uh, but also some legal costs and some interest costs are not includable in basis, but virtually everything else is. The, the third bullet down also alerts you that before we do this calculation, we need to know where the property is located. And if it's located in certain areas, you can actually boost or increase that basis number before we do the calculation and you can end up getting more credits. The two areas wherein the property can reside and get this boost are first qualified census tracts. People will frequently refer to them as QCTs. And you might think of these as either poverty impacted census tracts or, or census tracts where you have a high percentage of folks at 60% of AMI and below. Um, or the property could be located in a small, difficult development area. And you might just roughly think of those as areas where it's costly to develop. So, so you, they are typically uh, higher income areas. So these areas are, are identified and, and made available through HUD, the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development. And you can go to their website and query maps of, for example, your county and query, okay, show me all the qualified census tracts and it will overlay those qualified census tracts on the county map. And then you could also query, now go ahead and overlay uh, the small difficult development areas. And just to be confusing at the federal level, those uh, SDDAs, are not by census tract, but by zip codes. <laughs> but you can then overlay the small difficult development areas as well. And you can see where in my county might I get this boost to my basis and therefore more access to more credits. And developers are pretty interested in this, if not obsessed by it. That is, they prefer developments in these areas so that they can access a larger amount of credits and therefore entice in larger amounts of equity to help defray their development costs. So again, you may hear developers talk to you about, mm, I'd rather do my business in a QCT or an SDDA. Um, okay, let's move on to the next slide. And let me just check how I'm doing on time. Okay, we're gonna motor through here. Um, I've given you, I'm, I'm just gonna go through this really quickly. You can stare at it later. Just how does this work in practice, this formula where you take the percentage credit that you're using, multiply it by the basis? Let me show you an example. Let's assume you've got a 100 unit project and you're gonna use 9% credits. You're going after 9% credits. And let's assume further that this total development cost for this 100 unit project is gonna be about $55 million. So that's you know about 550,000 a unit all in. And let's further assume under that first bullet that of that 55 million in total development costs, about 50 million are includable in basis. So when you take out land and interest costs and other legal fees, about 50 million is available in this example um, to count as basis. The second bullet says, let's further assume you're in a DDA or a, a QCT. So the boost is a 30% boost to the basis figure before calculating the credits. So you multiply the 50 million in basis by 130%. And now instead of using 50 million as the multiplier, we're gonna use that boosted number 65 million. So the 9%, the third bullet down, the 9% credit formula would be 9% times 65 million equals 5.85 million in annual federal credits. And I said that very slowly because Annual federal credits represents here is the tax benefit that's going to be available to that partnership and ultimately that limited partner in year one of the project's operation. And another 5.85 million is going to be available again to that investor in year two. And another 5.85 million in year three, all the way out through year 10. So really there are 10 years worth of 5.85 million in tax benefits available in this example or 58.5 million in credits over the 10 year period. You with me? That investor is gonna get that 5.85 million in each of 10 years. So when the investor is thinking about bidding on the tax credits, what they're really bidding on is the 58.5 million. 
But they're also accounting for the fact that, that money devalues over time. So the time value of money makes the 5.85 million that they're gonna get in year 10, a little less valuable than the 5.85 million that they're gonna get in year one. So they factor, that is the investors factor a number of things in when they make their bid. Um, but what they're bidding on is this 58.5 million plus those depreciation and other losses that, that form that, that bundle of tax benefits. Now, that final asterisk I've got down there at the uh, bottom shows you that here in California at the state level, um, TCAC has actually, the, the administrator of these credits has actually limited how much one can apply for and receive for a single development. And that's 2.5 million in annual federal credits or 25 million over that 10 year period. So while my example shows you under federal rules, you could qualify, man, you could pay for the entire development probably uh, just from equity. In California, in an effort to spread the credits around, they've limited how much each project can get to 2.5 million. And so investors at the most are bidding on 25 million over that 10 year period. Okay, how about if we, let's go to the next slide and then we look at that very same project but now we're using the tax exempt bond 4% model. So again, the $55 million deal, total development cost of course is what it is. It's the same regardless of the funding package. Um, again, it's still 50 million in basis. It's still in a QCT or a DDA. So they would still get that 30% boost. We would still use the 65 million as the multiplier in the formula. The third bullet down shows you the difference. That is, instead of the 9%, we're using 4% times the 65 million. In this case, um, that project would, um, would warrant 2.6 million in annual federal credits or 26 million over the 10 year period. So a lot less under federal rules than the, um, than the 9% credits would allow them to access. But here in California, actually, more than you could get in the 9% program because California limits you to 25 million on the 9% side, but does not similarly limit you on the 4% side. So you could actually access more equity conceivably in this example by going the tax exempt bond 4% route. Okay, um, I'm seeing a lot of things in the chat. We still wanna hold them. Or, you want to take a few questions, Bill? Yeah, let, yeah. just while it's fresh in people's minds, why don't we pause here and just take some questions? Okay, so I have one question that asks, there are some areas that are located in a part DDA. Do those also qualify, qualify for the basis boost? Oh, you mean part of the project is in a DDA and part of it isn't? I think that's what they're asking, yeah. Oh, man, that's a really good question. And I'm sure we encountered that, and I'm trying to recall the answer. Uh, that would be a, this is, this is so chicken, but here I go. Consult your tax attorney. Uh, I, I'm not sure how that's handled. Um, I doubt that it's prorated. And again, maybe somebody. Oh, okay. says, uh, no, the whole census tract is located in a part DDA. Yeah, I guess it comes down to where is the property located? I, is it in the DDA part or not in the DDA part? Uh, you know what I'm saying? So I, I think it boils down to, is the property in the DDA part or is it outside of the DDA part? If it's in, you get the boost. If it's out, you don't. Did that answer the question? Um, we'll wait to see if he uh, okay. comments anything Follows else. Up. And then okay. we have another question that says, how do you win an award if it is not in the highest high resource area? As that is the major tiebreaker for competitive awards. Yeah, see, I'm so glad somebody brought that up because I actually went back to, to TCAC's annual report. It's on their website. You can go look at the annual report. And on page 32 of that report, it talks about, uh, my understanding is, I think it was, it was either 2019 or 2020. It might've been 2020, was the first year that the tiebreaker, and we're gonna talk about this in an upcoming slide, the tiebreaker in the scoring system can get tweaked a little bit if you're in a high opportunity area. Um, and what their annual report says is in 2020, 11, 
of the 103 9% projects awarded, so, so TCAC awarded 103 9% awards last year, 11 of them were located in high or highest opportunity areas. So that's 11% of the awards. Now, that's not to say, you know, depending on the area you're working in, you might get beaten out by a high or highest resource area located competitor. But it looks like only about 11% of the deals were actually in those high or highest opportunity areas. Now that percentage may go up over time. So that was the first year of implementation. Uh, this same annual report says they tried to moderate the effect of this. That is, they don't want, that is TCAC, the intent was not to get all developments into high and highest resource area. What they were concerned about was that in the past, almost none of them were in high or highest resource areas. And so they wanted to tweak the system to at least get some spread of developments across the different resource areas, including some in the high and highest. So the intention is to, to have it be a feature, but not the driver. And it looks like in year one, it wasn't the driver. Now, they're gonna keep an eye on it over time. And, and I think most developers are probably still keeping a hard eye out for high and highest resource areas. And then it does give you some competitive advantage. But at the moment, at least, it doesn't look like it was the driver in the 9% system. I should tell you that same annual report says in, in the then non-competitive 4% system, seven out of 181 awards were in high or highest resource areas. And there was no incentive to go in there in their system. It was non-competitive at the time. Um, and so that was about a 3.9% uh, rate of, of awards going into those high and highest resource areas. So it does look like the 9% system did push people to more aggressively seek developments or, or properties in those areas. But uh, you know, it looks like it more than doubled the rate that went into those areas by virtue of the competition, but uh, not, not yet the complete driver. Thanks, Bill. Those are the only questions for now. We're a little bit over time. So are you able to wrap up in about a minute or two? I know. Okay, so the next 20 slides, look at them yourself. <laughs> no, no, you know what? There's only a couple I'm going to highlight. So why don't you go ahead and start clicking? Click. This simply describes how TCAC takes those 9% credits and puts them into buckets within which people compete among themselves within those buckets. Go to the next slide. Along with those buckets, there are regional apportionments. So they take that big aggregate amount of 9% authority and they also drop them into various regional buckets. So again, you may be competing against competitors if you're not in one of those set-asides in your regional bucket. You see about five bullets down, it says Inland Empire. That's uh, Riverside and San Bernardino and a little piece of Imperial County. And you can see it's 5.3 million in annual federal credits or about, or about 53 million um, you know, in 10 year credits that's available each year. Okay, next slide. Uh, this just shows you they have a scoring system. And again, developers can walk you through and I, I just alert you to it because developers may tell you, hey, I need a site that's near a bunch of amenities or I need, you know, public funds to help me get leverage points, et cetera. Uh, okay, next slide. Um, it's not uncommon with TCAC's 9% scoring system that everybody gets the maximum score. That is, I, I think my advice would be, if you've got a development and it's not getting the maximum score, you might wanna just save the paper because it, these days it pretty much requires full points uh, to be successful in the competition at the state level. Uh, so then you get into tiebreakers and there's this first one, which I won't go into. We'll go to the next slide. Sometimes that first tiebreaker is decisive, not all that often, but sometimes. Um, but it really comes down to this final tiebreaker. And let me just spend a second here. The final tiebreaker, you may have heard about the dreaded final tiebreaker from developers. It's really a combination of a couple of ratios. The top most ratio in this slide is important. It's soft resources. So that soft debt resources as a, as a percentage or relative to the project's total residential development costs. So the idea there is you want a high ratio. So you want lots of public resources typically. So that's where local, local governments, if they can make soft loans to the deal, it makes them more competitive and could be decisive in this final tiebreaker. Uh, the State Department of Housing is another source that contributes 
uh, to this stronger tiebreaker. So if the developer is going for local funds and state uh, Department of Housing and Community Development funds, that will really help them competitively. The second ratio, and forget all the math there, but is really about, there's an incentive to take your project's eligible basis and reduce it voluntarily before asking TCAC to calculate your credits. The idea is they're trying to stretch the credits and they will reward you competitively if you voluntarily step away from some credits. So that second ratio, you want to be a small ratio. That is relative to my total development cost, I'm asking for relatively little uh, basis to be counted toward the calculation of credits. And it's a combination of those two ratios that gets you a tiebreaker. And in the next couple of slides, and so Jeanette, you can just click through the next couple. Yeah, I, I show you the math. I show you an example, and I think you can go to the next slide. In this example that I've shown you, um, it gets a 50% tiebreaker. This next slide that, that Jeanette has just put up um, simply illustrates what we were talking about earlier, which is when you get your final tiebreaker, there's one last adjustment available. And that is if you're in a high resource or a highest resource area, you can get a boost to that tiebreaker. And that can be decisive. At the moment, it's not completely driving the system, but over time it, it may increase in impact. So it's important to keep an eye on that. Okay, the next slide. Okay, and here's where I'm just gonna pause and say, I'm not even gonna go through these next slides. But what I've shown you is something that's pretty new. The tax exempt bond process, the, the process for developers to go get tax exempt bond authority, and they're working in conjunction with bond issuers who actually apply for the authority, um, is now competitive. When I was with the tax credit program, we had at the state level a surplus of tax exempt bond authority. We don't anymore. And so now it's competitive. They've got a new scoring system. The subsequent slides show you that scoring system. It's a little different from the 9% scoring system. It has many of the same scoring factors, but they're a little different. Um, but you have to be competitive now in that tax exempt bond system to access those 4% credits. Again, it used to be non-competitive and you could kind of kind of waltz in to tax exempt bond authority and, and um, an allocation of 4% credits, but that is no longer the case. Um, Jeanette, if you would just click down a couple of slides, there's just one slide I wanted to dwell on. One more, one more, right there. This is one significant difference in the tax exempt bond competitive system is they also have regional apportionments, but they have a region that they refer to as the inland region. And it is very unlike the 9% system inland empire region. This inland region is very inclusive and it goes all the way up to San Joaquin County, just, just south of Sacramento. So, but it includes San Bernardino um, and Riverside counties and so, and, and Imperial County for that matter. So you are now lumped into this kind of big, I guess I'd call it a non-coastal region south of Sacramento called the inland region. That now is your pool of regional competitors. But other than that, you now have the slides just to, you know, just to, um, sensitize you to the scoring system uh, over there in the tax exempt bond uh, process. Um, and, and the developers, of course, are now familiarizing themselves with that system and can also alert you to what's critical in that system. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much, Bill. I mm -hmm. always learn something new from your presentation. So we'll turn it over to Gary just to wrap us up. Great. Thank you so much, Bill. And, and Laura, I think she had to, to jump off as well. But uh, we're so grateful that you're able to share uh, these resources. Again, these are some of the building blocks um, as, as cities, uh, nonprofits, and, and our development partners are, are working on some of these projects, especially as, as we're coming into this new funding. Um, Alan had mentioned this at the, at the get-go, so I just want to kind of close with this. Uh, the county does have an RFI process, a request for interest process that um, we're working with. Uh, several cities that have submitted uh, during this uh, this RFI process, and we'll continue to work with those cities. Uh, but we want to encourage you as as you're looking for uh, these new projects that that you want to work on, especially as the state's home key funding is coming out, and and uh, you can seek for those funds to partner with uh, your development team. Um, development teams are critical. I think if 
if there's a big takeaway from Laura's presentation and Bill's presentation, and kind of tying back to some of the, the other remarks from Alan, is this is a, a difficult puzzle to put together. And so selecting your development partners is critical, making sure that they can help you navigate through some of these pre-development stages of site selection, entitlements, uh, your funding stage where you're, you're going after the right source of funding that matches with, with your unit mix that you're, you're trying to pull together. Um, having that team work with you is, is critical. So as you look at our RFI and we're going to, the county will amend that and send that out to, to everyone that's on not only the, the SCAMP mailing list, but also uh, our county developer mailing list, as well as our um, ICH list. Uh, we'll, we'll get that out to you as we learn more. I know the budget is, is uh, being adopted. State budget is being adopted uh, as we speak. And so as we learn more, um, on the home key uh, front from the state, we'll have that information um, as a part of our RFI that you can look at. You can look at what the state resources are and, and how can you uh, kind of pull your financing and your projects together to, to be ready. As, as Laura said, the key in all this is the more ready you are with entitlements, with financing, uh, the more you can put your project out there and, and, and get these units in the ground, because that's ultimately what we're trying to do together is put units in the ground for patients today. So Alan, I don't know if you want to wrap up with any other closing closing comments or Jeanette. Uh, just say thanks. Everybody have a good, uh, we'll be back in touch soon. Look forward to the next session. Thanks for everybody joining today. Thank you.